A universal declaration of human rights. It's been 70 years since the milestone document was adopted to ensure equality and justice without discrimination. But has it made the world a better place? And what are the human rights issues facing the world today? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. December 10th marks the 70th anniversary of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The document outlines 30 fundamental rights that should form the basis of democratic societies. The UN says it's as relevant today as it has always been. But with multiple examples of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, just how enforceable is it? Mike Hanna takes a look at the birth of the declaration and whether it still holds any influence. Born out of recession, the devastation of war, and an act of genocide executed on industrial scale, the declaration was passed by the UN General Assembly in 1948, with the US Ambassador Eleanor Roosevelt a guiding force. Its intention to ensure that such tragedies did not occur again. But in the decades since the declaration has been marked more by transgressions than example, the key problem, the lack of enforcement. The body established to protect these rights is the UN Security Council, an often divided body in which national agendas rather than individual rights remain supreme. A Syrian state that carries out chemical attacks against its own people is shielded from sanction by a Russian veto, which is joined by China in blocking any action against North Korea and in threatening a veto to hold the Myanmar military to account for what the UN's own investigators call a genocide. Any attempt to take action against Israel or even condemn it for transgressions in occupied territory is routinely blocked by a US veto. And even former champions of the declaration do not live up to their promise. The US president insists the maintenance of trade is more important than seeking accountability for a murdered journalist. The killing of Jamal Khashoggi contravened a number of articles of the declaration. Yet despite what many, including U.S. senators, maintain is compelling evidence of guilt, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia remains unsanctioned. Jamal Khashoggi is one of those cases where you look at it and you go, you know, what is the point of fighting for human rights when, you know, a man can walk into uh, an embassy and, and, and be cut up into pieces and tortured and there's no accountability. Article 14 states everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. But in what he describes as putting America first, President Trump is in daily transgression of the document a U.S. ambassador helped draft 70 years ago. As you know, multilateralism is under attack and, and there are some pushbacks in human rights too. Uh, it, gives, it, it gives me the impression that sometimes when some leaders of the world speak uh, relativizing human rights and saying that, uh, or multilateralism, others feel like there's license to say it also. 70 years on and the world may not be the better place the drafters envisaged. And yet the Universal Declaration of Human Rights remains as testament to what should be a living reminder of the philosophy that individual rights are intrinsic and cannot be endowed or taken away. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, United Nations. Dr. Seema Samar, Chairwoman of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, thank you for joining the program. Not only are you a medical doctor, but you're also a passionate defender of human rights. I'd just like to begin by asking you, when did you become such an advocate of human rights? Thank you very much for having me in the program. Uh, born in Afghanistan as a female and seeing all the discrimination against women and also against the different minority groups in Afghanistan and uh, continuing uh, conflict in the country since 40 years, as you know, has put me in a position to fight for equality and human rights. Now, it's the 70th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights. That 
declaration gave a framework uh, towards human rights. When did you become aware of the Declaration of Human Rights and how much of an impact it, has it had on your work in Afghanistan? I became aware of the human right, uh, Declaration of Human Rights when I was quite young, maybe around 75. And I think the, the equality and, and put the human dignity in the focus was a reason for me to fight for uh, and use it as a tool for fighting for equality and human rights. And I think it's a, it's a document, I believe, that uh, draw a clear line between aggression, violence, and civilized tolerance work, and, of course, focusing on human dignity, inequality between any person without recognition of their geographical position or color, religion, belief, and language, and so on. So that is a tool to be used for promotion of equality uh, everywhere, and particularly in my country, in Afghanistan. If people aren't prosecuted for war crimes, for crimes against humanity in conflict zones, do they feel that they can uh, get away with doing more and more violations against human rights? Of course not. Uh, I think that's why I'm saying that it should be a mechanism in order to deal with those things. Because if we really uh, continue like this without any accountability, and we see more and more a commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity around the world, and nobody is keeping them accountable. And I think in order to save humanity, in order to save the human dignity, we need access to justice. And in my view, access to justice is not a luxury. Access to justice and have, living in just society is a basic human right. And everybody has the right to have that luxury. Dr. Seema Samar, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thank you. Let's bring in our panelists in Bangkok. We're joined by Benjamin Zwaki, a human rights researcher in Colchester. Jeff Gilbert, professor of international human rights and humanitarian law at the University of Essex. And in Stockholm, Johannes Moskin, director of communications at the Right Livelihood Award Foundation. Welcome to the program. Let me begin with you, Benjamin Zwaki, in Bangkok first. Is the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights a gold standard, or is it, is it the baseline, uh, the, min, the bare minimum countries uh, should be adhering to? Well, it was intended as a baseline minimum in uh, 70 years ago. In the wake of World War II, the world was perhaps more amenable than it is 70 years on to uh, considering these rights and agreeing almost universally across the board when you look at, at the 18-member the uh, committee that drafted the declaration to accepting these rights and agreeing to adhere to them. 70 years on, they're being seen now as, as almost untenable. untenable. Uh, it was always a declaration. It was never an enforceable convention or treaty. So in that sense, um, it would be difficult to, to, uh, to press a legal case to begin with, although these days even conventions or treaties are not adhered to with the same sort of commitment that they were 70 years ago either. Let me bring in uh, our legal expert here from Colchester, uh, Professor Jeff Gilbert. Jeff, we've heard a lot uh, in the last few minutes about accountability, about enforceability. Um, because this is a declaration, it doesn't have any real legal teeth, particularly in international law. Is that right? The declaration, like any other General Assembly declaration, does not in and of itself have binding legal qualities. But over the 70 years, the declaration has come to reflect customary international law, which is binding on states. The problem, as always, with international law is enforceability. Uh, it's all well and good to have documents, treaties or declarations that set out rights. The difficulty is always trying to get those rights upheld by states, and that requires states to stand up and be accountable and to hold other states to account. It requires mechanisms for individuals to make complaints, and it requires the international community as a whole to put in place procedures so that rights can be verified and commented upon. And all those systems are now in place that were never there back in 70 years ago. What I think the Universal Declaration on, of Human Rights has done more than anything is that it's made it 
unquestionable that states are held to account when those rights are seen to be violated. Nobody would expect silence anymore when rights are violated. What we now need is, of course, for greater accountability, greater enforceability, and for mechanisms to be respected and for the rule of law to be upheld. Let me bring in Stockholm here and Johannes Moskin. Is that right? Are states paying attention to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Are uh, prosecutions taking place? It feels like that we are in a place now where human rights violations are simply seen more because of the 24-hour news cycle, because of social media, uh, because of the media landscape that we're in right now. Uh, but things seem much more bleak when it comes to human rights globally than ever before, perhaps. Well, I think the, the answer is not as, you know, black and white. Uh, yes, we see accountability and yes, we see how important the Universal Declaration on Human Rights has been and how important it is every day um, advancing a more just, peaceful and sustainable world. But of course, at the same time, I, I very much, you know, agree also with the picture you're painting with lots of states getting away with with the you know the most horrible violations of of human rights uh within their own countries and also abroad so um i guess the, the major thing lacking is uh, political willingness and courage to actually make sure that these uh, human rights are being respected now let me bring in bangkok here and benjamin zawaki is there a structural problem here with uh, the way the united nations works uh, because it doesn't have an enforcement policy or is this simply that states are paying lip service to the universal declaration of human rights but actually they're not really pushing forward uh, within their own countries to prosecute those responsible well it's a combination of both the un has suffered from from a structural uh, deficiency ever since the Security Council was was founded uh, in the wake of World War II, and of course, 70 years on, it's a, it's an almost anachronistic uh, council when you look at its composition. But I think more importantly, what you have in, in the 21st century, in contrast to the middle of the 20th century, is number one a situation in the United States in which its uh, executive, chief executive, ever since the turn of the, the century, has either been, in the case of the Obama administration. Uh, well-intentioned but extremely weak in its uh, execution and prosecution of human rights, and in, in the case of, of his predecessor and successor, successors in Bush and, and Trump, two individuals who have been in open and demonstrable opposition to human rights. On the other side of the globe, literally, you have China, which is a, a vastly different country now than it was 70 years ago, and which has been in opposition to human rights really from the very beginning, seeing it as largely a Western project, and whose foreign and domestic policies both do not take human rights into account. So absent uh, leadership on either side of the world from the two largest and most powerful global powers, what the United Nations does and does not do becomes far less relevant when those two actors, permanent members of the Security Council no less, are unable or unwilling to enforce these, these mechanisms. Let's bring you Johannes um, here, Moskin in Stockholm here. Are there any successes that you can point to uh, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has made um, human rights violations prosecuted. People have been sent to jail for their violations because of the act itself, or the declaration itself. Are there any successes? Yeah, uh, there are several of, of uh, such examples. I'm thinking, for example, uh, one of our laureates, Jacqueline Modena from Chad, who is you know, being engaged uh, over decades to to bring uh, the former dictator Hassan Abriya to, uh, well, you know, to take him to court. And he was finally, after, after many, many years, he was sentenced. Uh, so, yeah, there are many of such examples. The problem is that there are too few. The legal framework for all of this um, suggests that uh, there needs to be more accountability. We have actually discussed that. But is there a solution uh, to this that's acceptable to the entire international community? Are there, law are there tough enough laws that can be brought in? I think let's start by saying that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was never meant to lead to prosecutions. OK, criminal law is one thing. International criminal law is one thing. International human rights law is something else. 
And what we are trying to do with the Universal Declaration is hold states accountable. Say to states, these are the minimum standards that we expect you to employ with respect to all those within your territory, subject to your jurisdiction. And that's the idea behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the idea behind all the human rights treaties. And we have seen since 1948, many, many states held to account either before treaty bodies at the regional level or international level, the Human Rights Committee, the Committee Against Torture, or through the special procedures that exist, such that uh, the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons, Special Rapporteur on Torture, go into states. They're there. What we have seen through the human rights mechanisms is states being told this far and no further. Of course there are going to be violations. There's violations every day of domestic law. And nobody says that the legal system of the United States or the United Kingdom or Sweden or Thailand is ignored without consequence. What we see with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the starting point for the world to acknowledge that the way states treat their own populations is now a matter of international concern. It is not something that's just hidden away. And one of the biggest changes that was brought about by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it was the stepping stone to, to speedier decolonization or by Western powers. It's part of all that process. Yes, we now see, with the International Criminal Court, the opportunity to prosecute people who commit war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, genocide. But that's a parallel path to holding states accountable for their human rights violations. And that's much better now than it was 70 years ago. It's a stalagmite and stalactite um, approach, if, one, if you must steady drip drip that improves things. Is it perfect? No. Why have I got a job? Because it isn't perfect. And I am going to keep on trying, as long as I keep working, to improve human rights around the world, as are all the other people speaking in this discussion. But Dr Jeff Gilbert, is it, is it a strong enough mechanism for you to do what you just said, to try and improve human rights around the world, or is it a flawed document? Um, could it be better? Yes, of course it could. Is it the best I have got? No. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was the starting point. We've had a series of treaties since then, but treaties have to be ratified. What the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does is say to every state around the world, this is the bare minimum, this is what you've got to try and uphold. And of course, in the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen Universal Periodic Review where on a regular basis states are brought before the Human Rights Council and have to account for their human rights record to other states in the global community. This is now something that is so much, for, so much that was unimaginable in 1948 that states, all states, have to come and account for their human rights treatment, uh, record, their human rights record, on a regular basis. I mean, yes, could it be better? Am I going, would I like it to be better? Of course. But Am I going states, to work with what I've got? All states aren't yes, equal. Yes, and keep on trying to improve things. But all states aren't equal. Benjamin uh, Zawaki no. mentioned China and the US uh, there. Let me just get back into that. Are some states deliberately uh, either bending the rules or uh, simply ignoring uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for their own interests? Yes, I think that's that's clear that that's that's the case. Not uh, not all human rights violators are the same, but but by the same token, not all human rights violations are the same. I think one of the reasons that I would disagree with the former panelist about things uh, improving as opposed to the trend moving in the in a more negative direction is that when you look at human rights, too often both state actors and non-state actors, the international uh, organizations, NGOs, etc., often see human rights as being equal across the board, and they, they are not. They are universal and they are indivisible, yes, but there are certain human rights violations that are considered the most egregious of all, and you mentioned them earlier in the program, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, ethnic cleansing, and too often we see states deal with those crimes in the same way that they might deal with, for example, 
attacks against the media or arbitrary detention or, or something of that nature, which again are, are unacceptable violations. And yet in a world of finite human and financial resources, unless there is a more concerted effort at going after the most egregious violations first and foremost, we're going to see states openly flout these laws and indeed get away with it. Let me bring in uh, Johannes Moskin here. You've heard what our guests have had to say. Is it time then for a refreshing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or is the document itself profound enough to last another 70 years? Well, um, it's quite astonishing how well it was formulated. It was mentioned, yeah, it, there are probably room for improvement, but thinking of other things written 70 years ago, it's quite amazing how well it's it, it can be used to adopt also to new challenges. And um, I think th the major problem is not changing any and or doing making any amendments to the to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It really comes down to the political willingness. We, we have heard about, you know, the, the UN Security Council uh, as one of the major obstacles moving ahead. And um, yeah, I think it really comes down to to states to show another type of courage and political willingness to actually respect the rights we have, rather than a great need to sit down, everyone together and, and reformulate it. Uh, Professor Jeff Gilbert in, in uh, Colchester, political willingness, we seem to keep coming back to that, but without enforceability, political willingness just will never be there. But political, political willingness only comes about by people campaigning and keep on holding states to account, even if there isn't a place, a forum by, by, in which you can try and get these rights upheld so that states are held accountable. What you can have and what this program is all about at one level is saying to the world, these rights exist, these rights need to be remembered at all times and governments need to be reminded that they have to live up to these standards. What is interesting is that states very rarely say we are violating human rights, who cares? What they actually say is we are not violating human rights. What we are doing falls within the standards that we are meant to meet. That is what has to be challenged and it is challenged not just by other states, it's challenged by activists and by academics and by the general people saying this document exists, how are you fulfilling its obligations? I'm just going to ask each of you the same question, if you can keep it short, because we are coming to the end of the programme. The start with you, uh, Benjamin Zawaki in Bangkok. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, is it a flawed document or is it simply a document that is absolutely necessary in this day and age? I'm going to ask all three of you the same question, if you could just answer very quickly. It is absolutely necessary, but it is inherently flawed in that it does not have an enforcement mechanism, and in an era in which trying to name and shame states as the first and foremost uh, ways and means of holding states accountable, it's simply insufficient 70 years on after its, uh, after its drafting. Professor Jeff Gilbert, what are your thoughts? It was never intended to be the end of the line, and yes, we've had much better documents in terms of drafting and in terms of enforceability since, but the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the one that we can always turn to and always holds all states accountable to that, those standards because it's universal in its application. Uh, Johannes Moskin, finally we'll end with you. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I would uh, definitely. I would say um, we should look at it also as a, as a living document. It can be used to, to uh, uh, to meet new challenges, and uh, even though there, yeah, the major problem is is the political willingness. I'll, I'll end with that. Many thanks to all our guests, Benjamin Zwaki, Jeff Gilbert, and Yanahanis Moskin, and thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com, and for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash inside story, and you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at. AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.